That's fine. <coughs> Good afternoon. Uh, welcome. I'm Deepak Thapa of the Social Science Baha. Uh, perhaps some of you are not aware, but this afternoon's lecture actually kicks off a three-day conference called Changing Dynamics of Nepali Society and Politics that the Social Science Baha'i is organizing along with the Alliance for Social Dialogue and the Association for Nepal and Himalayan Studies. And it is on behalf of all three organizations that I welcome you this afternoon. I will keep my remarks short because I'm sure you came here to listen to Professor Fisher. However, I cannot help but draw paddles between what is happening today and another conference the Social Science Baha had hosted back in April 2003. The Agenda of Transformation Inclusion in Nepali Democracy was the conference. And just as today, we had opened the conference with the Mahesh Chandra Regmi lecture, the inaugural one, which had been delivered by the late Dr. Harka Gurum. This lecture itself was instituted with the consent of Mahesh Chandra Regmi himself. And although he had shied away from public life for years, Partly as a result of his frail health, at our fervent request, he had been present on the first lecture given in his name. The picture you see behind me on the banner shows him on that occasion. I believe he thought the event to be of some significance, for that day he chose to don the same shirt he had worn to receive the Raman Maxese Award in 1977. You'll see the picture printed in the uh, lecture that will be handed out to you as you leave the hall uh, at the end. It was indeed a sad day for Nepali scholarship when Mahesh Regmi passed away just two months later. As for the conference inclusion in Nepali democracy, when it was held, the concept of inclusion was yet a long way from becoming part of the national lexicon. And we at the Baha would like to believe that we played a small, though I would venture to add, not an insignificant part in popularizing the idea in Nepal. We believe that the conference beginning today is an apt follow-up to the one held in 2003, uh, 2003, since as a country, we are then still in the phase of identifying the myriad problems ailing Nepal, particularly the social dislocations that were gradually becoming evident with the Maoist insurgency providing the backdrop to it all, even though at the particular time of the conference, a ceasefire was on. As a country, we have traversed a great distance in the intervening eight years. And it is perhaps time to examine what has changed, not only since then, but also go further back to the beginning of the reinstatement of the democratic era, albeit interrupted some two decades ago. We've been very fortunate to have received the financial assistance of the Open Society Foundations New York and the Embassy of Switzerland here in Kathmandu. Without their support, it would not have been possible to host an event of this scale. And we'd like to acknowledge their contribution in making it possible to bring so many scholars from around the world here today to deliberate on and perhaps make some, se make some sense of the transformations Nepal is currently undergoing. I also want to thank the Alliance for Social Dialogue and the Association for Nepal and Himalayan Studies for joining hands with us in putting this conference together. About the Alliance for Social Dialogue, there will be occasions in the next few days to hear more about it. But now I want to invite Professor David Holmberg, a longtime member of the Association for Nepal and Himalayan Studies, or ANHS in short, to say a few words about it and the conference as well. David? Um, namaste. Um, Deepak asked me to say a few words um, about <clears throat> the Association for Nepal and Himalayan Studies. Um, although I've been a longtime member um, of this group and edited what was uh, once the newsletter of that association, it is really um, our main speaker today. Uh, Professor James Fisher, who was one of the founding uh, fathers of this organization. Um, the ANHS, it's an international organization of both scholars and scholarly institutions focused on um, research 
and scholarly work um, in the greater Himalaya, Karakuram, Hindu Kush kind of zone um, high, of high altitude Asia. The ANHS, the Association for Nepal and Himalayan Studies, grew out of a prior organization, which is called the Nepal Studies Association, uh, that was first formed in 1971. And then um, it was in 1999 that they broadened uh, the scope of the organization to include the greater Himalayan region. The core membership, however, remains uh, scholars who work in Nepal and, <clears throat> excuse me, primarily North American uh, scholars, although there are several international members. There's some 13 major universities now who hold institutional uh, memberships in the ANHS. It has been, however, in the last few years, in the last decade, um, that the association has made real advances under a very energetic um, and competent new generation of scholars, including Mahendra Loati, one of the co-organizers of this event, Arjun Gunaratne, and the current president, Jeff Childs. The ANHS has also uh, begun a collaboration with the Social Science Baha here in Kathmandu, uh, and there is a, now a Kathmandu Research Center um, of the uh, uh, Association of Nepal and Himalayan Studies, um, a uh, center that is here to support scholars uh, and students conducting uh, research in the Nepal. The ANHAS has a main publication. Uh, it's called Himalaya, yeah, which has turned into a true academic journal. And as I understand it uh, from uh, Deepak Ji, this is now available uh, and, uh, in Kathmandu. It evolved out of what had just been a newsletter into something that's really quite substantial in terms of its scholarly contributions. Among other things, uh, the publications um, and uh, the organization of conferences and the like, the uh, ANS, N -A -N -H -S also uh, provides uh, uh, some monetary support to scholars. They uh, have a senior research fellowship, um, which is awarded uh, on an annual basis. They also have a prize for the best student paper in Himalayan studies uh, called the Dor Bahadur Bista um, Prize. The uh, ANHS also uh, provides support, particularly to Nepali scholars, to travel to international conferences. This association meets on an annual basis, usually um, at another uh, meeting, a South Asia meeting that's held in Madison, Wisconsin. But this fall, um, for the very first time the, that I'm aware of, the uh, association is holding uh, a separate uh, conference focused entirely on the Himalayas. It is entitled Rethinking the Himalaya, the Indo-Tibetan Interface and Beyond, and this will be held in October uh, in uh, McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. If you uh, want to know more about the organization and um, what it does or take advantage of some, uh, uh, you know, submit a paper, those of you who are students here for the prize, there's a um, website, just Google, you know, uh, Association for Nepal and Himalayan Studies and you will find also more information about the association but also about this specific conference. Now, I, I don't want to go on too long here. Uh, the other thing Deepak asked me to mention a bit was this conference that um, Professor um, Fisher is going to give the kind of inaugural um, uh, address in. And this actually, uh, Mahindra Loati and I began talking about this uh, quite a while ago. And the idea was to uh, try to put together uh, papers that were um, engaging um, different domains of uh, the this, this sort of state of knowledge in particular domains. It has kind of transformed into a broader kind of uh, theme of change, um, and most of the papers deal in one form or another with change uh, and the contemporary circumstances of Nepal. 
Uh, we hope um, in particular that many of these papers will be, uh, we will be able to organize into volumes uh, and uh, publish in the not too dear, not too distant future. And on that note, um, I think I will uh, turn this over to, again, to whoever it is that's going to introduce Professor Fisher. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, uh, with apologies, I would like to beg the, uh, the indulgence of this gathering as we conduct a brief ceremony that is uh, specific to the social science Baha and that uh, we'd like to undertake with the consent of our fellow organizers. Uh, many of you here know, uh, today know that the social science Baha was the beneficiary of a generous grant of 5 million rupees, or it sounds much better when we say 50 lakhs, uh, from Mr. Bihari Krishna Shrestha to set up an academic fellowship. Uh, without dwelling too much on the fact, there is no denying that Mr. Shrestha's action was exemplary of what, what one might call academic philanthropy in Nepal in the finest sense of the term. Although he was initially quite reluctant that it should uh, carry his name, we prevailed and he consented to its being called the Bihari Krishna Fellowship for Ethnographic Research. It just so happens that the Bihari Krishna Fellow, the first Bihari Krishna Fellow has been selected and formally starts a fellowship tomorrow. And we wanted to take this opportunity to recognize the first fellow in your presence. With apologies again, I would now like to call upon Mr. Shrestha to come to the stage and the first Bihari Krishna Fellow for Ethnographic Research, Shrestha Basnet, to join him to receive a citation that recognizes her as that. Mr. Shrestha and Shrestha. Uh, that basically says the first, uh, what is it, see? the Bihari Krishna Fellow for Ethnographic Research 2011, Shrestha Basnet. Uh, now a few words from Mr. Shrestha. I have been allowed only B Sabda. So my first Sabda goes to Shrestha herself. I would like to welcome her as the first Bihari Krishna Fellow for Ethnographic Studies. And Sreshna ji comes with a very impeccable CV and a great career already. Although as young as she is, she, has a, she already has had a great career. So from her, after a year and some months, we can look forward to a document, a work that is more or less equivalent to what she herself calls Sheti Sariti Manas in line with Ram Charita Manas. Therefore, I wish her a great success in her endeavor. And at the same time, I will also use another Sabda to thank Social Science Baha, who has taken upon itself to, to run this uh, fellowship and then manage it. And it was only a few months ago that I hand over, handed over my donation to the Baha in this very hall. Now, within a few months, the Baha has been able to bring the fellowship over to this stage where we already have won the first fellow on, under this program. Therefore, I would very much like to thank Social Science Baha, particularly Mr. Deepak Thapa, and also the Academic Council that has been supervising or steering this program. Therefore, I very much look forward to continuing this cooperation with Social Bar, and I would like to thank them very much. Thank you. Uh, now, I now request uh, Shrestha to say something even briefer. Good afternoon. It is an honor to be speaking here today. I'm here to thank Mr. Bihari Krishna Shrestha for his generosity and this opportunity, Dr. Rajendra Pradhan for supervising my research, um, to Social Science Baha and Nepal School for giving me a uh, physical as well as intellectual space. 
Um, I have barely started my research project, so I have nothing much to say, except that um, the broad theme that I'm looking at is construction of good society. I'll be using oral narratives. I'm learning Tamang language, watching lots of Tamang movies, and listening to lots of Tamang songs right now. I hope that I will have a lot more to say at the end of this research project, and I look forward to the day when Mr. Bihari Krishnas Resta and Dr. Rajendra Pradhan will, have to, will thank me for the work I produce. Thank you so much. Thank you to you both. Uh, we now move towards the lecture. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to uh, ask my associate Nacho to offer a kada to uh, Professor Fisher. Uh, introducing the speaker today, uh, to introduce the speaker today, I call upon Dr. Rajendra Pradhan, who is the former chair of the Social Science Bar, uh, in fact its founding chair, and, but who is currently now the dean uh, of the Nepal School of Social Sciences and Humanities. Rajendra. Uh, thank you, Deepak. Um, I think before I, before I begin, can I request all of you to kindly switch off the mobile phone or put it on silent mode? I think we have a jammer, but uh, sometimes it doesn't work. And um, my request is that we um, respect the right of all of us to listen undisturbed to the speaker today. And it's also, I think, the first principle of democracy is respecting others' rights more than own rights. This is a, you know. So uh, let me begin uh, by saying namaste, good afternoon. And again, on behalf of Social Science Baha, the Alliance, of Social, uh, Alliance for Social Dialogue and Association for Nepal and Himalayan Studies, I would like to welcome you to today's lecture. Again, I'm just repeating. And I would like to extend a very hearty welcome to Professor James Fisher, who will deliver today's lecture, which is titled, in case you have forgotten, Glo Globalization in Nepal. Theory and practice. Thank you, Professor, for accepting our invitation to deliver today's lecture. Now, since this part of the program is focused on the lecture itself, let me go on to talk a lot more about the, the, the Bicentenary Lecture, which, as Deepak said, was instituted by the Baha to honor what we believe is Nepal's foremost and finest scholar. Regmi's research and prolific publications on Nepal's political economic history have inspired many scholars, Nepalese and foreigners, and perhaps more foreign scholars than Nepali scholars, many of which do not or have not read Regmi Ji. But we believe that Regmi's publications are essential readings for anyone who wants to understand Nepal, the past as well as the current situation. Just think, just think of the processes of Parvatiya Hinduization that were instituted in Nepal much before Rana's Mulli came in 1954, which everybody cites. But they did not go beyond and use Regmi's documents to, to look beyond or uh, further than 1854 and look at the demands being, met, being made by the Adivasi Janjati groups for control over Jal, Jamin, Jungle in the traditional homelands. All this you can find in this rich corpus of documents and uh, writings by, by Regmi. Now, all this somehow seems to be forgotten about it. And I think that, that without you know, understanding the past, without understanding the, the past 
and it documents is very difficult to understand the past present history there is in, in fact a lot we still can learn we still can learn from regnish's publication and the documents he collected which are now i believe stored at in trivun university at the central library which i think perhaps no one is using now the first maestro regnish lecture as deepak mentioned was delivered by the late harkabad guru in 2003 as the keynote address and regnish ji was present in his wheelchair despite his illness that was his last public appearance the lecture continue, continues to be called my sandra regni lecture and not memorial lecture because we believe that he is still with us in his publications which continue or rather should continue to inspire scholars on nepal despite despite post socialism post modernism and other post ism fads that come and go but i think that his work is solid and all these post isms come and go i think and you know somehow we are missing this the core i think of all these studies of uh, the nepal history i think seven distinguished scholars have delivered the maestro regni lecture after hartke guru one each year the historian kumar pradhan in 2004 the anthropologist yerak tofa and michael opitz in 2005 uh, and 6 the political scientist ashish nandi in 2007 <coughs> the historians david laden and romila thapar in 8 and 9 and last year we had the political scientist and nobel laureate elder ostrom today's lecture is the ninth in the series is also as deepak mentioned the keynote address of the conference <coughs> these annual regnish lectures testify to both the deep respect that eminent scholars have for regnish scholarship as well as and not to be immodest about it bas own reputation as nepal's finest institution for scholarly activities indeed the regnish lecture series is arguably the most the most reputed scholarly event in nepal's nepal's annual calendar this is thanks of course to the scholars also thanks a great deal to all of you who attended lectures we have often been asked what is the chief guest why do you invite chief guest or special guest for a functions the answer is simple for us the people who attend the lectures or functions that is you as well as the invited guests are the invited speakers are the chief guests and not some minister or some movie star or beauty queen or whatever and for today's function our additional chief guest is obviously maestro regni whose portrait occupies a special place in his dais this is why we don't have chief guest and you know big you know, background bases and other things like that now let me briefly introduce to the speaker james fisher was professor of anthropology and sociology uh, and asian studies at carlton college in the usa where he taught for 38 years in addition to introductory courses <coughs> excuse me Professor Fisher taught on South Asia, anthropological theory, and biography and ethnography. While still a professor at Carleton College, he spent two years in Nepal as a Fulbright professor and helped start the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Trivun University. This was about 25 years ago, and I think many of his colleagues and students are here today. After retiring from the college in 2009, he was also involved in starting a new college in Bhutan, where he served as the chair of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology for the one year. Professor Fisher has now retired from his official duties, but as he lectures, lecture proves, he is still active intellectually. 
Professor Fisher's research interests lie in South Asia, especially Nepal, where he has done fieldwork on and off for the past 50 years. He first visited Nepal in 1962, and then in 1964, he accompanied Sir Edmund Hillary to set up educational institutions for the Sherpas. And I just heard that one of his first students in the, of the institution uh, you know, is here. His first major field work was on the economy and, uh, and ecology among the Margars of Dolpa in 1968-69. He then turned his attention to the Sherpas. In, uh, so he worked on the Margars in Dolpa and then Sherpas later on. His research with them was on education and tourism in the 1970s and 80s. Finally, he conducted a person-centered ethnography on Tonka Prasad Acharya. This was in the late 80s and early 90s, who, as you know, was the Prime Minister of Nepal in 1995. These researches resulted in, in uh, publication of three major books, Trans-Himalayan Traders, Economy, Society, and Culture in Northwest Nepal, 86. Sherpa's Reflections on Change in Himalayan Nepal, 1999, Living Martyrs, Individuals and Revolution in Nepal, 1997, which also published in Nepali as Judo Said Haru. His publications also include Introductory Nepali, this was in 1965, and the edited book Himalayan Anthropology, Indo Tibetan interface. In fact, this was the first book that I saw of uh, Fisher, I think, in, in about 1979. In today's lecture, you will use materials from its three major research areas and themes to reflect on globalization and the changing dynamics of Nepali society and politics over the past 50 years. Having had the chance to read the lecture, I'm convinced that Professor Fisher is an excellent teacher, not to mention researcher. The lecture is extremely well written, effortlessly weaving, interweaving theories, themes, and, ethno and ethnographic material, such that even someone who is not familiar with anthropology can easily understand the arguments you will be making. I'm sure that you'll enjoy listening to this lecture as much as I look forward to hearing it. And I'll not say any more about the lecture because it's, I think it's very, very clear. As is the custom in this lecture series, we'll not, I repeat, not have any question and answer sessions after the, uh, the lecture. However, you are welcome to meet Professor Fisher during high tea to discuss questions you may have. And also, as Deepak mentioned, you're welcome to collect your copy of the lecture, of his lecture, on the way out after this program is over. I would now like to invite Professor Fisher to deliver his lecture. You ma hapa porna lecture series ma malai nimto dino bayakuma ma social science balai danyabad dina chahanchu. Mahesh Chandra Regmiko Samjanama organized Garieko Hunale, Yo Mexico Mahatwa Bariko Ho. Hami Sabalai Tahachaki, Mahesh Chandra Regmiko Nepalko Artikityasma, Tulo Yogadan Cha. Now at this point, I ask the indulgence of the audience if I may switch languages. Um, the, the reason being that if I try to continue to give this lecture in Nepali, uh, I'll uh, be in very, very uh, difficult straits. I'll be way over my head uh, in very deep water. And if I drown, that won't do you any good or me any good. So bear with me while I try to do this in uh, English. And let me continue by saying that um, it is also a great personal honor to follow in the footsteps of the many distinguished scholars who have delivered the Regmi lecture before me, especially my friend, mentor, and personal hero, Harka Gurung. This is as good a place as any to say 
that my entire intellectual development and career had been informed and immeasurably enhanced by my association over the decade, decades with truly exceptional Nepali scholars, both within and outside the academy. I cannot imagine what it would have been without them. Whatever modest contribution I've been able to make over the years has been due to the influence of remarkable writers, thinkers, and friends, such as, in addition to Harka Gurum, Dwar Bahadur Vista, too loud? Uh, okay. um, my writers, thinkers, and friends, such as, in addition to Harka Gurum, Dwar Bahadur Vista, Vista, Rishi K. Shah, Meena Acharya, and Bihari Krishna Shrestha. And I do not forget my colleague, my extraordinary colleagues at the university, such as Chaitanya Misra, founder of the department there, and Krishna Bharachan, both of whom are here today. And there are many others. You know who you are, and uh, that you are too many to mention. Now then, for my remarks this afternoon. This lecture does double duty, since it also serves as the keynote address for the conference on changing dynamics of Nepali society and politics, which is an ambitious topic indeed. Those of you participating in the conference can choose to address whatever part of that mouthful of words you choose. Somehow I take it that I should cover all of it. But if a single word can be used to summarize the experience of Nepal in the first decade of the 21st century, that word is surely change. But the conference topic is not just change or dynamics, but doubling the ontological question and quadrupling its complexity, changing dynamics, which I take to be not only change or dynamics themselves, but the meta question of how change itself is changing. And not just Nepali society, which I feel marginally comfortable discussing, but also Nepali politics, a topic which represents much more precarious and treacherous ground. In any case, I certainly have noticed no lack of change in Nepal since I first came here almost 50 years ago in 1962, when there were virtually no hotels or restaurants in Kathmandu, and rarely was a car seen on the streets of the nation's capital. Sometimes I'm asked, what is the biggest change I've seen in all this time? I like that question because it's so easy to answer. The biggest change I've noticed, especially when I'm off trekking in the remote and difficult and steep terrain of Dolpa, as I was doing this year, is that I'm no longer 22 years old. <laughs> this raises the important point that the anthropologist far from being a disembodied and unengaged external spectator, is aging and changing along with the people. The observer and the observed are wearing the same watches. It is not always easy to distinguish between what has actually changed in the observable empirical world, on the one hand, and on the other, the dissimilar perceptions held by a naive, wet behind the ears, recent college graduate versus a recently retired professor. Both the Nepalis I have known over the years and I are not only a little older, but maybe even a little wiser, although whether my wisdom has kept pace with theirs is another matter too. But young or old, since those early days I have observed and sometimes participated in change in a variety of venues, through involvement in long-term, in-depth experience and study of a small number of small places, as is the anthropologist want. It's not so much that anthropologists study small places, usually villages, as that they study in villages, where they examine the same things that, some, that other scholars study in other places, whether large, such as nations, or small, such as individual human beings, or even places where there are no real flesh and blood living people, as in literature. 
That is, we anthropologists study things like humor, honor, ambition, bravery, fear, loathing, and death. I want to mention three separate instances of changing dynamics, which at first glance seem utterly unconnected. The first is the Sherpas of Solokumbu, now famous around the world for their strength, stamina, mountaineering skills, and of course for Tenzing Norgay's achievement of climbing Mount Everest in 1953. I first went to Solokumbu in 1964 and continued to visit there off and on for 40 years. Of all the many ethnic groups in Nepal, they are least in need of an introduction. The second is the farming and trading Kaiki-speaking muggers of Dopa, who are, by contrast, not famous even in Nepal, and about whom many of you will never have heard. I spent an uninterrupted year with them in 1968 and 1969, mostly in the village of Saratara, which with a population of 365, was the largest village at that time in Dopa. I returned to Dopa after a lapse of 42 years in March and April of this year. And the third example is an influential political figure, Tanka Prasad Acharya, with whom, along with his wife, Rwanda Kumari, I held extended conversations in the late 1980s and early 90s about the beginnings of democracy in Nepal and his role in founding the first democratic political party in the country, which led a revolt against the Ranas. Indeed, these three spheres are unconnected in almost every way imaginable. And I sometimes wonder how I ended up in such different parts of the country with such different kinds of people following such different ways of life. The prospect of speaking to you this afternoon gave me pause. It made me realize the time had come to talk about what I had been doing in addition to what I thought I had been doing in those places all this time. As a result, I hope to show that, despite all their multiple differences, they share two analytical commonalities. One is that they all are, or were in the case of Tonka Prasad, undergoing the process of globalization, but an aspect of globalization not normally recognized as, discussed, as, uh, as uh, such and is discussed even less. The second commonality is seen through an emphasis on what in anthropological jargon is sometimes called practice, a term as obscure as globalization is common, and which I will try to clarify momentarily, but which for the moment we can take as the idea that human behavior is genera generated more by the things that we actually do than the beliefs that we hold. Since all this happens on a more or less unconscious level, this entails the ancillary proposition that since we do not know what we are doing, what we do has more meaning than we know. The rest of my remarks will attempt to expand on these two portentous notions. Let me start with globalization, a word first coined as recently as 1950, but which has achieved such common currency that one can hardly avoid it now in any newspaper, magazine, TV program, or even internet blog. It is a word which sounds as if its meaning should be obvious and transparent, but which becomes harder to pin down the closer one, the more closely one examines it. What does it ultimately amount to, globalization? At its conceptual core, it might be defined as the expansion and intensification of social relations and consciousness, consciousness across time and space, which, while time and space themselves, are dramatically compressed. Or, more briefly still, it may be thought of as a long-term but accelerating historical process of growing worldwide interconnectedness. Of course, broadly understood, globalization is not a recent process at all. It has been underway for a very long time, as long as human populations have been moving from place to place, whether across a river, a mountain range, or an ocean, transporting ideas and ideologies, including religions, 
along with the material goods they carry with them. Certainly one might argue, in the Nepali and American cases, that globalization has been the fundamental part of their national histories, with unending successive waves of immigrants from all directions, beginning hundreds and even thousands of years ago. These population movements constitute a double-edged demographic sword. They have both contributed to and helped resolve many of the problems these two nations face today. Not only is globalization old as a social and demographic phenomenon, but even the antiquity of its self-conscious genealogy is old, as seen in the reply of Diogenes, the third century philosopher, philosopher made when anyone asked him where he came from. His answer was always, I am a citizen of the world. However, today I focus only on recent changes and uh, stages in the growth of that globalization, changes that dramatically altered its pace, scope, depth, and character as the last half of the 20th century came to a close and the 21st century began. I do so in a very limited and small-scale way, again, the anthropologist's predilection. Yet what at first glance might seem to be minor developments hardly worth mentioning may in the long run decide the shape of events that ultimately carry the day. Definitions notwithstanding, unlike other ization words, that is words such as industrialization, urbanization, westernization, modernization, and even the popular derivative term development, all of them terms that seduced the post-World War II generation, Globalization remains a vague and elusive concept, even as it is largely displacing, displacing those isation words. Therefore, I suggest that what the term globalization needs to flesh out its substance is not more bloodless abstractions of the kind I just quoted, or an analysis of world systems theory of the sort espoused by Wallerstein, but real life examples capable of breathing shape, color, and sound into it. This is easier said than done, however, because although the efforts of globalization, the effects of globalization are, like those of culture, powerful, the people doing the globalizing or being globalized are, again, as in the case of culture, not necessarily aware of them. If I may briefly jump ahead of my three examples, this was certainly the case with the first batch of Peace Corps volunteers to Nepal in 1962, when a small group of 70 people, previously unknown to each other, exemplified the expansion uh, and intensification of worldwide interconnectedness by being caught up in the sudden globalizing pulse that dramatically interrupted their everyday lives. Americans, some of whom had barely been off the farms they grew up on, or had never flown in an airplane, suddenly dropped out of the sky into Nepal. Whatever effects they may have had or not had on Nepal, during their two years in Nepal, they encountered conditions which were utterly and entirely new to them, along a variety of dimensions. Religious, Hindu and Buddhist. Familial, joint family. Political, absolute monarchy. Educational, wrote memorization, and dietary, dalabat. These dimensions of existence globalized them profoundly, although, although they didn't think of it that way. Whatever occupation or life they followed in the next 50 years, Nepal remained a formative and an ineradicable part of their lives. Inexorably bonded to it, they were unalterably transfigured and transformed by their intensified connection to it. That itself is only of anecdotal significance. What makes it important for globalization is that they then return to the US where, already globalized by, by Nepal, they spent the rest of their lives globalizing the American communities they lived in by explaining and illustrating the facts of life in Nepal as they saw them, and probably progressively exaggerating them through nothing other than being part of the institutional routines of everyday American life, schools, churches, civic organizations, jobs, and the like. 
As a result, although most Americans would still have trouble locating Nepal on a map, few would now mistake Nepal for Naples, as many of those Peace Corps men did when they fir first learned of their assignment 50 years ago. This is part of the story of how American society began to experience seismic changes about a half century ago in politics, gender, race, and profession, aided and abetted by a new wave of unprecedented voluntary peace activism. The identities of individual volunteers and the Nepalis who got to know them were challenged, forged, and altered. What has happened to them, to Nepal, to, to the United States, and to the world since then is as much a part of globalization as currency exchange rates. The subject-object dichotomy disappeared because we were wearing the same watches. These developments have been part of a transformation of American society and Nepali society to the limited extent that I, as a queer anthropologist, can understand it. It's true that all this involved basically the people of only two nations, but to beat a conceptual retreat by calling it nothing, nothing other than an instance of internationalization and asserting that the world consists of just a couple hundred nation states ignores some fundamental realities about how the supposedly international world works. The trouble with the internationalization stance is that it ignores the existence of large and influential but non-national organizations such as Exxon, which has a larger economy than that of New Zealand. Globalization is alert to what internationalization overlooks. That is one of the problems with conceptualizing globalization, the assumption that it is mostly about economics. Indeed, economists have successfully hijacked the term, as they often do, after all, it is an ill wind that blows no economist good. What needs to be emphasized, by contrast, is that globalization involves more than $4 trillion worth of currencies being transacted every day, because globalization is also a human phenomenon, as illustrated by such facts as that at any given time, five lakhs of people are sitting on airplanes. Now, that may be an important economic fact for the airline industry, but it's also important for those five lakhs of people who uh, may be flying to new places, uh, having new conversations, new experiences, which cause them to see the world and their place in it in a new way. Globalization is social, social and cultural, but it is more than that. It is also experienced by individuals grappling with it one at a time. My argument rests on the assumption that Peace Corps volunteers can be seen as data points in the continuing paradigmatic shift that altered the United States and Nepal during these roughly 50 years. One might object that 70 volunteers in a country of 11 million people, the population of Nepal at that time, could not make any impact worth thinking about. But first of all, this ignores the fact that over a period of two years, each volunteer interacts with hundreds of Nepalis. And secondly, that their relations, some of which are conducted in the fractured Nepali of the volunteers, are often personal and of some depth. But to return to sheer numbers, what about 3,000 volunteers, which is the number who had served by the end of the tenure of the Peace Corps in Nepal in 2004? Or of the many more thousands of volunteers from other nations, such as Japan, UK, Germany, or Denmark, who came to Nepal or the one lakh or so NGOs in Nepal, many of which, at various levels of involvement, comprise still more examples of ongoing globalization. Or two lakhs of people, which is the number of Peace Corps volunteers who have served in some 139 countries over the last 50 years, or all those from many countries who have worked in such multinational organizations as Crossroads Africa, or Doctors Without Borders, or Wildlife Conservation Society. Globalization, in this more comp comprehensive social sense of the term, is everywhere, even if we do not count the 880 million international tourists who travel every year. Therefore, I want to proceed along the lines of Giddens' argument that globali globalization is not only about what is out there, 
remote and far away from the individual, it is an in-here phenomenon too, influencing intimate and personal aspects of our lives. Some might argue that globalization is just a taken-for-granted context, macro context, too abstract and unwieldy for anthropologists to handle. But if that objection can be challenged by investigating Wall Street investment bankers ethnographically, as has been done, then Peace Corps volunteers and citizens of Nepal can certainly also serve as grist for the globalization mill. Looking at globalization as it plays out in these kinds of organizations this way contextualizes it, localizes it, and grounds it in the lives of real people living in real time and real space. Working on a smaller canvas like this results in a picture featuring more vivid contrasts and sharper detail than be can, can be seen in the vast but impersonal panorama of capital and labor transfers. Framing the picture in this way allows us to interpret the picture at its own indigenous level rather than prescribing from far and above how the picture should be drawn. Unlike the artist, the actors, such as Peace Corps volunteers and Nepali citizens, had no idea that they were stock players in a worldwide tableau. As a vernacular buzzword, the term globalization means different things to different people. I and live in one or the other according to the season, agricultural as well as trucking and mountaineering. At first glance, the people of Dopa seem very similar to the Sherpas. Northern border residents, Tibeto-Burman speaking, Buddhist, agricultural trading community, remote. As was the case with Kumbu, my first trip to the Tichurong Valley in Dopa in 1968 was a two-week trek, starting from the trailhead in Pokhara, which itself could only be reached by, reached by air in those days. As in Kumbu, an airstrip subsequently built in Dopa cut that travel time from two weeks to 40 minutes. A major difference, however, is that Dopa people do not live at the bottom of Mount Everest. To this day, relatively few tourists are attracted there. But in its more modest way, Tichurong has been globalizing and, globali and globalized for many decades and probably centuries. They have traditionally traded their millet and buckwheat for rock salt from Tibet, which they then exchanged for rice and manufactured goods in the lower hills of Nepal. Just as they transported goods between contrasting ecological zones, they also were in the middle culturally between the northern Buddhist, Tibetan-speaking Botes and the southern Hindu, Nepali speakers, populations which generally didn't know each other's languages and did not travel to each other's territories. Hence the critical role of the interstitial muggers who spoke both languages and traveled to both areas. For good measure and as a way of making their ethnic diversity even more complicated than it would have otherwise already been, they threw into the mix their own distinctive language, Kaike, spoken by about a thousand people in only three villages in the world. At village school, as village schools arrived in Tichurong, much more slowly and less well equipped than they are in Kumbu, increased mobility for Dopalis has been slower to develop. But gradually more education has enabled some Tichurong villagers to begin to expand into larger, more lucrative parts of the national and world economy. Alongside the traditional trade in salt, grain, and small-scale manufactured goods like cloth, cigarettes, and uh, tennis shoes, a few entrepreneurs have entered the world of Tibetan carpet manufacturing in the Kathmandu Valley. In doing so, they, or rather their children, also begin to lose their Kaiki language, but retain cultural strength in other ways by residing near each other in the Bodhanat area and renting meeting halls where they celebrate Tichurong holidays communally. In very recent years, they have been well positioned to harvest Yarsagumba, summer plant, winter insect, is the literal Tibetan translation, from the high pass located just three hours above their villages. This crop, regarded by the Chinese as a potent aphrodisiac, and sometimes referred to in English as organic Viagra, is vastly more lucrative than they could have dreamt of previously. 
In a month or two, a family might gather enough yarsagumba, one or two kilograms, to earn two or, two or three lakhs of rupees, cash income far in excess of what they could have earned before. Even more than with their traditional trans Himalayan trading and investments in Tibetan carpet manufacturing, the Yarsagumba trade takes them very far afield, in a few cases to, to destinations as distant as Hong Kong, China, and Singapore. All this is acti activity by people whose movements have been largely restricted until very re recently to within the borders of Nepal, although the goods they trafficked in, the economic side of globalization, came ultimately from Tibet and India. People whose social life outside their villages had not gone behind, beyond entering a tea shop on a dusty trail in western Nepal now march self-confidently into the Hyatt Regency. These changes have come mostly at a slow pace. The Dopalis are obviously aware of their new opportunities and take advantage them, of them as aggressively as they can. But the opportunities come gradually enough that they all seem to be a, a part of the natural order of things. That they are made possible by vast changes in technology and an encroaching and globalizing world is not fully comprehended. Even the very recent introduction of cell phones to teach Iran, which has reduced the time needed to transmit a message to or from the United States from two months to two seconds, is already considered routine and unremarkable. Luddite that I am, I relied on their technological expertise to execute commands on my own cell phone. In the kinds of transformations I've been describing, people act as part of large-scale systemic globalization processes, whether they know it or not. Just as in the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna finds himself impelled to fight without knowing the larger context of the battles in which he fights. But sometimes an individual, by being in the right place at the right time, gets caught up in unpredictable but dramatic life-changing ways. This was the case with the cantankerous old Dopali who played the elderly village leader in the film Caravan. Since I ran into him several times in Dopa, I could see that in the film he simply played himself, bigger than life and magnified many times on the big screen. Once upon a time a village leader, he became known around the world for playing the same role he had been playing all along in Dopa. The film is even more globalized and globalizing in that its director was a Frenchman and the film was eventually nominated for an Oscar in Hollywood. Globalization in the case of Tonka Prasad was also of an obviously more individual type and he too assumed, assumed the role of a star, although a political one. Tonka Prasad's initial encounter with globalization followed his learning of English as a child and his subsequent discovery of the great liberal political tradition of the West in the works of such thinkers as Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, Karl Marx, Lenin, Voltaire, Rousseau, Napoleon, H.G. Wells, and Bernard Shaw. Their ideas excited his imagination beyond anything he had theretofore read of in the Pali language books available in the 1930s, or had heard about from his parents in his traditional Brahmanical household. These books transformed his perception of pol political realities in Nepal and his life. Afterwards, as in the cases of the Sherpas and Dopalis, there was no turning back. As a consequence, instead of following in the stiff footsteps of his father and pursuing the humdrum life of a mid-level civil servant under the Ranas, he chose the career of a political revolutionary, founding the first democratic political party in Nepal, which ultimately landed him a lifetime jail sentence at the hands of the Ranas. Much of the, much as the Ranas would have liked to execute him, they just could not bring themselves to incur all the sin or pop that, as devout Hindus, killing a Brahmin would entail. As consolation, they had to satisfy themselves with executing his friends, the four martyrs. After ten grim years in the Kathmandu Central Jail, Tonka Prasad was released when the Rana regime was finally overthrown 
and he eventually became prime minister in 1955 in a democratic government, a position he had first learned about from his readings in English political history. As prime minister, he had the rare opportunity to globalize his country in a spectacular and unprecedented literal way by opening diplomatic relations with China, the Soviet Union, Japan, Egypt, and Switzerland. Thus, in varying ways, these three examples show how globalization works, not only at the global economic level, but at the social, cultural, political, and even personal levels. It is a process in which neither regional state histories nor particular ethnographic identities go far enough because globalization transcends them. Just as biology can tell us that leaves fall in the autumn, but not exactly when any particular leaf will fall, globalization cannot predict exactly which people will be mobilized and maneuvered out of their comfort zones. But that does not gainsay it as a ubiquitous force which can be neither denied nor escaped. All these cases assume the epistemological position that only insofar as one does things is it possible to know about things. But no one proceeds from a blank slate. Tonka Prasad's knowledge of Western political philosophy preceded his own political activity, both of which formed a feedback loop that deepened his prior book knowledge. What matters, ultimately, is the ways in which globalization can be grasped and turned to one's advantage, rather than otherwise, whether individually, culturally, or nationally. But the familiar and unavoidable macro-micro question, which plagues all of social science, remains. That is, how does the unfathomably vast and impersonal force of globalization become translated into the routines of everyday uh, events in Nepal? Compression of time and space is one thing. The rhythm of a 24-hour day and location at a specific longitude and latitude and altitude is another. What is the mechanism by which individual human beings confront and manipulate the globalizing changes they meet head on or try to, whether they are aware of them or not? The standard anthropological answer is that anth globalization operates the same way any other such set of influences operate, that is, culturally. Since human beings are primarily cultural beings, it should just be a matter of identifying a culture, with that, which anthropologists are supposed to be good at, composed of such changes which guide the behavior of people sharing a common lifestyle. A conventional way to do that is to operationalize culture as a set of rules which constrain or encourage people to behave one way or another. They apply to any domain of life, marriage, religion, or economy, for example. Instances are not hard to find. There is a wide variety of marriage practices in Nepal. Some groups practice matrilateral cross-cousin marriage. Communal religious rituals are found in many places, sometimes in the form of a community religious system in which households hold annual feasts by turn. It is well known the division of labor may follow along class, caste, ethnic, or gender lines. Defining culture by rules, or deriving it from them, has the advantage of being explicit. However, it also has the unintentional effect of construing individual human beings as cultural zombies, mindlessly following rules handed down to them. Whereas in real life, culture is not only structured but also restructured by actors over generations. Changes over these generations cannot be accounted for by a listing of rules for any one generation. Furthermore, mere knowledge of rules is not necessarily the most critical tool to use in negotiating one's way through the obstacles that life puts in our way. This can be illustrated in various domains. One can easily imagine someone mastering all the official rules governing football matches, yet still being an, an indifferent player. By contrast, what the great football player requires 
much more than a knowledge of intricate rules, is a feel for the game, a sense he can get only by playing it. Thus, it is more true to say that people do not do so much, do not so much follow rules as improvise on the spot, not randomly, but within boundaries which culture sets, according to the demands that they confront in the practice of whatever game of life they are playing. Such improvisation results in strategies which are, like the globalization that helps generate them, unconscious. In the case of the matrilateral cross-cousin marriage rule practiced in Dolpa, what if the mother's brother's daughter is not the right age? What if the mother's brother doesn't have a daughter? Or what, worse still, what if the mother's brother, mother's daughter, what if the mother doesn't have a brother? Do these states of affairs preclude the possibility of marriage because they violate beliefs and rules about how marriage should be ex executed? Of course not. What people do in these cases is improvise. They find a classificatory mother's brother if there isn't a real one, or an unrelated bride if there are no classificatory relatives available. If a rule is impossible to follow because uh, one, what one has to do to obey it is too difficult or impossible, one has to manipulate it or find a way around it according to whatever opportunities present themselves. Oper opportunities that are under the most stable conditions inexorably changing, and certainly changing under the pressure and presence of globalization. Similarly, if a family's turn has come to host an annual village feast, as with the Sherpa case of celebrating the Doomjay festival, and if they skip town, someone else will fill in, and whoever reneges on their obligation will eventually face the consequences. What one does or doesn't do becomes paramount, regardless of belief. Or, if only men do the plowing, as in Dopa, because plowing causes pain to the bullock, which is a sin, and women and lamas should not sin. And if there are no men available in a particular household for plowing, swaps with other households will be made. What is essential is that the plowing be done, and it emphatically will be done, by devising and invoking new rules if need be. Among the muggers of Tichurong, as noted above, Men do all the plowing and trading, while women do most domestic chores and all the agricultural work except for plowing. If a man lacks helpers on his trading trips, his wife might help out if she doesn't have small children at home to care for. In the Sherpa case, Buddhist monks are generally celibate. But if they are not, and even reincarnate lamas are sometimes, sometimes stray, such an errant monk might leave the monastery and start a family. Sherpas recognize quite explicitly that monastic vows cannot always be kept. If they are not kept, they might regret it, but there is always wiggle room around them. The point is not that improv improvisation is preferred to following norms or rules as a rational strategy. The point is that in real life, improvisation is the only thing that works. Tonka Prasad's wife observed a traditional Brahmin diet. No tomatoes or onions or garlic, not to mention chicken or eggs. But when Tonka Prasad was serving his life prison term, she began to meet wives of other imprisoned politicians who not only observed more liberal diets, but who were also uh, annoyed by her insistence that she cook all her own food. So she said to herself, well, my husband is in jail and eating forbidden foods and enjoying new commensal rules, and I want to eat too. So she began thinking about examples of intercaste dining in the Mahabharata and also in the Ramayana when Ram happily ate food prepared by a low caste woman. Rewanta Kumari gradually realized there were alternative rules, seemingly at odds with those by which she had always lived but for which, nonetheless, a case could be made about what she could or could not eat. She changed her diet accordingly. Similarly, the Ranas outcasted Tonka Prasad in prison by shaving his head, including his tupi, or topknot. 
This was the most serious punishment they could give him, short of execution, aside from life, life imprisonment. When Tonka Prasad was finally released from jail, his wife's family wanted to invite him for dinner, but according to caste rules, could not do so because, being outcasted, Tonka Prasad was no longer a Brahmin. Even Rwanda Kumari was tainted, tainted by her association with him. But her family also had to face the reality that this commensal rule conflicted with the more general rule that it would be a violation of social logic and sheer human decency for them not to eat with their son-in-law, who had suffered so much for his country and for which he was nicknamed the living martyr, just because of a caste rule which he had had no role, role in breaking. So they broke the dietary caste rule, requiring commensal relations only with other Brahmins, and went ahead with their dinner date with Tanka Prasad. A political example more relevant in today's conditions is Tanka Prasad's actions on behalf of what in those days were called, in English, untouchables. As a political radical espousing social equality, he could not countenance the deprivation and prejudice against the low-ranked artisan castes stipulated in the Molki Ain. In the early 1950s, therefore, he put his money where his mouth was and led a procession of untouchables into Pashapadima. This movement met with strong opposition, but he was unyielding and insisted that it had to be done. As a result, 50 years later, the rules have changed and no one thinks twice about the elites going into temples. After this social and relig religious rebellion was over, he went to King Trivavan and told him that he should appoint untouchables to his cabinet. King Trivavan replied, half humorously, that Tanka Prasad already represented the untouchables, so why was there a need of anyone else to do so? Tanka Prasad did not view his actions as abandoning Hinduism, or even reforming it. Besides being a professed Hindu, reading the great epics, praying and performing occasional puja, he had little interest in the technical details of its philosophy or theology. He simply held a very different notion of what the human essentials of, human, of Hinduism required, usually expressed in terms of tolerance and hospitality. Whatever his notion of Hinduism was, it had no place for such blatant injustice as untouchability. By improvising in all these ways, doing whatever it is that they do, people assert their own agency and little by little, by little create their own culture, which differs from that which they have inherited from their predecessors. We are not being hypocritical in improvising in this way, nor even inconsistent, just creative and adaptive. We should not forget Aldous Huxley's aphorism that the only completely consistent people are the dead. If it were not the case that improvisation is unavoidable, cultures would never change, whereas they always do change. Slowly in isolated society, rapidly in cases where globalization is operating. All this is not to say that people never obey rules, or don't try to obey them, or wish they could obey them, nor is it to denigrate the role of ideology, which may seem, be seen as an elaborate network of rules and sub-rules produced by an endless series of improvisations. But it is to say that rules can be stretched or thrown out altogether, and new rules made for new games, as happens after revolutions, and new cultures created, and new individual behaviors fashioned according to the needs of the time and place by means of an implicit practical logic. People follow religious and social rules when they can, bending them as necessary when they need to, which results in new rules. Ideologies are always the final outcome of these pressures, including the political ideologies swirling around us constantly, and which are both causes and effects of the political improvisations we constantly practice. Everyone does this. It is not a matter of education, or literacy, or personality, or even culture. It is the way human beings live, contesting the incoherent spots in their culture, nibbling at the edges of them, pushing them in new directions where they can. 
It is the way we fashion and refashion, within historical limits, the structures that are so familiar to us and which, seem, and which come to seem so natural that they become, as we say, part of our culture. Cultural, culture results from this connection between agency and structure, just as the river carving new channels within its banks is connected to the structural lake into which it flows before it is emptied by yet another river. There are many forces at work in crafting the logic of practice by which logic norms in society are executed or not, but certainly globalization is one of those forces. It operates at many levels, economic, social, cultural, individual, and in many guises. And it comes from all directions, at us, from us, through us. It is everywhere, not just out there, somewhere in the economic stratosphere, but in here, in, in here too, inside our minds and hearts, and the goals and ambitions, or ideologies if you prefer, by which we live. Anthropological views of human agency, all too frequently and uncritically, resemble that of the hero of Camus' novel, The Stranger, who at the end of the book says that in the long run, one gets used to anything. The reactions we have seen in the Sherpa villages of Kumbu, in the Kaiki-speaking villages of Dopo, and in the urban lives of high caste, middle class, left-leaning political activists and leaders, show how people do not get used to anything, no matter what the circumstances. Instead, they react creatively and productively to move themselves and their cultures in novel and hitherto unexplored directions. Different groups, of which Nepal certainly has no shortage, find themselves in very different situations economically, socially, and so on, and therefore have different ideas about how to do this, which generates political opposition among the groups. But they all follow a logic based on what they do as much as on what they believe. They do so under the influence of globalization, the primary engine driving not just change or dynamics in examples which I discussed during this lecture, but changing dynamics, the process by which change itself is changing. Mira Ajiko presentation Sidai. Thank you, Professor Fisher. Uh, I will certainly not try to summarize uh, what you've just said. It is neither our custom, uh, nor does your lecture lend itself so easily to uh, another interpretation. But uh, I would like to thank you all for your presence here and making the uh, 2011 Mahishana Regni lecture a success once again. A special thanks goes to Professor Fisher for accepting an invitation and providing us with ideas to mull over in the days to come. I now request all of you to join us for high tea upstairs at uh, Darbar Hall. And as you leave the hall, please pick up a copy of the lecture. Thank you very much.